Uh, we have a great lecture um, in store for you this evening, and I'll uh, introduce Fiorella Trenzi in a moment to uh, tell you more about that. But just before we begin, uh, just to, very quickly, um, in case you uh, had admitted the planetarium before, I want to make sure you know that we're open every Friday and Saturday. These lectures that happen throughout the uh, semester uh, are special, but we're also open every Friday and Saturday throughout the year. We have planetarium shows, movies, laser shows, which are just for fun. And uh, up on the observatory, up on the rooftop, our uh, observatory is always open. And tonight we have uh, uh, members of the Brevard Astronomical Society here uh, volunteering to help out again. They help us out quite a bit in the observatory and by bringing their own telescopes. And we always like to uh, mention that because we really appreciate their help and their assistance. Um, if anyone is interested in the movie, there is a movie playing at 8 o'clock this evening. Um, I know most of you are here for the lecture, of course, but uh, if anyone was planning to do that, I uh, just want to make sure you know that you will have to exit the theater before the lecture is over in order to do that, and tickets are available at the box office. Okay, well, that's enough uh, announcements from me. Thank you all again for coming, and here is Fiorella Terenzi, the host uh, of our lecture series, to tell you more. All right, good evening. Good evening. Very good. How you say in Italian? Ah, very good, uh, Italian. How do you say in Spanish? Buenas tardes? Buenas noches? Okay, well, let's add one new language. First, thank you for coming. Tonight is the closing panel lecture of um, BCC Space and Astronomy lecture series. So we say goodbye just for the summer because we open again in October for the fall semester. So make sure you are on the mailing list so you can receive six invitations, right? Six lectures per year. So I'm not gonna bother you that much, but make sure your email is on our mailing list. And uh, next year is gonna be another fantastic time and I'm sure you will have a good time. So tonight is a very important panel. I'm very pleased that uh, such high caliber panelists uh, from NASA, United Space Alliance, and Space Florida agreed uh, to be on the panel. And uh, it's a very important subject, uh, what's next? Uh, how do we move forward America's space program? Right, we have important question, we have important point to make, and tonight is the occasion. On top, I was uh, extremely pleased that uh, a very well-known and acclaimed journalist from uh, Florida Today accepted the invitation to moderate uh, the panel. So I'm going to introduce John Kelly, the moderator, and he will uh, introduce our high-caliber expert uh, in the field. So John Kelly has covered the NASA and the space industry for Follow the Day since 2002. He serves as a local editor and is responsible for all news coverage for Florida Today and floridatoday.com. I'm a big fan of John and I do read constantly the weekly column on space he writes every Sunday. So thank you John so much for being here and uh, the panel and the event is all yours. Thank you, Fiorella, and thanks everyone for coming out. We're, we're really fortunate to have the group of people that we have uh, up here this evening, um, and I'm going to introduce them in, in just a second. Um, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, saving America's space program is incredibly important to me as an individual, as a person who lives here on Florida's space coast. It's important to our community, and it's important to our country. Um, launching people and spacecraft from our soiled orbit is important to United States leadership around the world and our national security. A thriving spaceport is critical to a healthy economy in Central Florida, and venturing out into the solar system is a fundamental part of expanding human knowledge. That's a lot of... <clears throat> That's, that's just critical to our being. Um, I, I just don't think we can un understate how important space exploration is. So the importance of our trans transition from a space program that is dominated by the space shuttle and space station programs to one that's a bit more fractured and complex demands the nation's full attention. 
The space program of the future is going to involve big government projects like the space station, but also smaller private and semi-private projects, and probably some projects that none of us could imagine yet. It will be a lot more fractured. It will almost certainly involve less public funding, and it will face additional scrutiny as our Congress deals with growing demands on the federal budget. And saving the space program may sound big and broad, because it is. The program is going to be threatened by inadequate funding. It's going to be somewhat threatened by the possibility of a failure to remain on track as political leadership changes. And our panelists are going to address those questions and what they see as the current state of the program, the future of the program, and the threats to its success. And, and most importantly, what we're going to try to address tonight with you is what they believe needs to happen in the coming years to keep the program on track. We'll save some time at the end for your questions as well. But first, I want to introduce who we have with us here tonight. And, and I'm sure as, uh, as we do that, I'd like you all to help me thank them for the time they're giving tonight. They're incredibly busy people working on very, very important projects, and they've taken some time out to come and be here with you tonight. Uh, first, we have Janet Petro. Janet is the Deputy Director of the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and uh, forgive me as I leave out some things. Uh, the, bio, the bios of the three people up here on the panel are, uh, they are illustrious. <laughs> so I'm going to cover the highlights, but... Janet's been in her position since 2007, and she shares responsibility for managing a Kennedy Space Center team of almost 9,000 civil servants and contractor employees. That's the number today. So anyone who thinks that there's not a lot going on out of the Kennedy Space Center, um, Janet may disavow you of that notion. There is indeed a lot happening out there. Uh, she began her career as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army after graduating from West Point. Uh, she served in the Army's aviation branch. Prior to coming to NASA, she managed projects and programs for Science Applications International and McDonnell Douglas Aerospace. She's worked on projects uh, as a, as a frontline manager and as a senior leader, working together with NASA, the Defense Department, and commercial space companies. Frank DiBello is the CEO of Space Florida. Frank uh, took on leadership of Space Florida in 2009 with the mission to retain, grow, and expand aerospace business in Florida. Now, he's worked on that sort of thing for about 40 years. In fact, if, if, there's, if you've been involved in any sort of space economic development project in Florida or elsewhere, Frank's probably been in one of the meetings at some point with you. I think he's probably been involved in just about every such project for quite some time. Um, in 1985, Frank received the Medal for Distinguished Public Service, which is the Defense Department's highest civilian honor. <coughs> He's taught at the Defense, Defense Systems Management College and the International Space University. And he served on countless panels for NASA, <coughs> the Defense Department, and private industry. Uh, and he is one of the most vocal advocates for space exploration uh, that I've met. Mike Leinbach is the Director of Human Space Flight Operations for United Launch Alliance. Now that's the company that operates the Atlas and Delta rocket lines. Mike uh, was, had a 27-year career with NASA at the Kennedy Space Center. And beginning in 2000, he led the launch team for all space shuttle missions. He's now developing the human space flight capabilities for the Atlas and Delta systems. Now ULA, the new company that Mike's working with, is the launch has the launch vehicle of choice for three of the four companies that are uh, vying to get involved in the commercial crew program with NASA. He also has a long list of awards, including the 2004 Presidential Rank Award, NASA's Exceptional Service Medal, NASA's Medal for Outstanding Leadership. Um, and uh, Mike, uh, Mike uh, launched the last space shuttle and gave, uh, gave some rousing remarks to his team and, and talked uh, about the future of the program in a way that 
I think um, she, he's just a strong advocate for, for the reason that we fly in space. Um, what I'm going to ask these three folks to do is answer these three questions, and they've each got a presentation. These are broad questions, and, and they'll address these, and then we'll come back and answer your questions. Uh, but I wanted to go back and repeat these. And one of them was, what is the space program now? It's been easy to define what it was up until maybe a year ago. It was easy for us to see it in the space shuttle program, in the space station program, in the science programs at NASA. Um, what are the threats to America's leadership in space exploration? And what needs to be done to overcome the obstacles? And what do they see? as the big picture, long-term goals of the U.S. space program. <coughs> and to sort of summarize that a bit, where might we be or where ought we be 10 years from now, 25 years from now, and 50 years from now? And with that, I want to turn it over to Janet um, to give her perspective from Kennedy Space Center. Okay, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and thank you, John and Fiorella, for having me here this evening and giving me the opportunity to be able to talk to this um, great audience about what's going on at Kennedy Space Center and in NASA and taking a look at our future. Um, I love the opportunity to do this. You know, um, I hope most of you know that about uh, 50 years ago, in 1962, Kennedy Space Center became a official field center for the NASA Space Agency. And so this year we're celebrating all year long different, uh, um, through different events, um, decades of support that we, have, that we have made to the human spaceflight program. And we at the center will tell you that we feel that we were the uh, heart of the manned spaceflight program. And hopefully tonight, by the time I get through with this uh, presentation, you'll um, agree with me that um, we're going to remain to be that heartbeat uh, within the um, manned space flight and space flight center within um, NASA. I have the uh, map up here showing us uh, uh, broadly uh, uh, there on the East Coast as, uh, a space, uh, as a space center, as I said, and we're going to um, remain that. So let me start out with um, the vision and mission, and you guys can read uh, the words up there on the chart. There's just a couple points I want to highlight for you. A couple words that are particularly meaningful for us um, this year and as we're looking forward to the future. You'll see the words uh, government and commercial access to space. And previously, if we, as, as we look back in our past, we had a program, a uh, large program, an iconic program. John mentioned it earlier about the uh, space shuttle. Um, decades, a very successful 30-year uh, program that we brought to an end successfully, in large part due to Mike here on the end, um, last year. And that, um, um, that, the decades of that support was a government-developed, um, government-owned, government-controlled, government-launched uh, vehicle. And so when I say the words government and commercial, looking forward in the future, that's a big change for us. And it's part of our vision as we go forward that we are no longer going to be just a government-only spaceport, but we're going to diversify and become both a government and a commercial spaceport. The other words I wanted to talk about is in the uh, mission statement down there, and that word is um, partnerships. And, um, you know, I think everybody is quite aware of the fiscal constraints that we have as a nation, and specifically for this audience, the constraints that have been put upon us um, in terms of funding levels. And as we go forward, you know, in the past we were able to rely on a single funding source from the federal government in order to fund our, the entirety of our space program, or most of the civil space program here in the United States. As we're looking to the future in both, in um, manned space uh, in particular, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, we're going to have to look at diversifying those funding sources and partnering more, much more closer than we ever have in the past, not only with other government agencies like the Department of Defense, but also with other government entities such as the state of Florida in Space Florida and also private industry and academia. So what's going on at the Space Center, as John said, there is a lot going on. And I put up here the uh, three programs, um, the three primary programs that are assigned 
um, to the Kennedy Space Center to execute on behalf of the uh, agency. And I have a slide on each of them. I'll talk in more detail um, about them. But you'll see a, a picture um, in the forefront of uh, Pad B. And we've made a lot of changes on that pad. And I'm going to talk uh, more about that also. So the first one is our launch service program. And a lot of people, um, you know, as, as John mentioned, you know, a lot of people thought that um, <coughs> the space shuttle program equaled NASA or the space shuttle program equaled the KSC Space Center. And it's particularly um, devastating for me as I walk, as I walk around our community um, with family, friends, neighbors, or even traveling around the country where people say to me, um, well, you know, is NASA going away? Are you, are you shutting the doors at the Kennedy Space Center um, program? And we're not, and I'm here to talk more about that, but we've always had this crown jewel at the Kennedy Space Center program, at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, this one program, uh, formed in 1998, has actually been the only program that we actually have housed at the center um, here, here in um, Florida. We've since added the other two, and I'm going to talk more about them. This launch service program is basically the unmanned side of space. So the, um, the planetary explorers, the Earth science missions, um, all the unmanned space vehicles, payloads, and cargoes, this program marries with the with a appropriate uh, vehicle, appropriate rocket, um, from the fleet of vehicles, and they do the acquisition, and they perform the mission insurance for it. And so this year, I've shown the four missions that we have up there. Um, and by the way, this program doesn't launch just out of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. They launch at other locations around um, the globe, Vandenberg, Kwajalein Atoll. Um, they've launched out of Kodiak, etc. So the four I've shown up there are um, what we're going to launch um, from this program in 2012. Um, the, the next one coming up is New Star, and that happens to be la launching out of uh, the Kwajalein uh, Atoll. So the team's really, really working hard. Right now it looks like sometime in June is when that launch is going to take place. Um, two of the launches up there are going to be out of Vandenberg and um, Iris is uh, uh, going to be out of the Cape, or I'm sorry, the uh, Tedris is going to be out of the Cape and the other two are going to be um, out of Vandenberg also. But this is a very, very robust program that we've had um, and sponsored at the center for more than um, 12 years now very, very successfully. You may recognize the mission that I uh, show over there on the left hand your right-hand side of the chart, the uh, Mars Science Laboratory, launched last November. A um, lot of media attention about this. It's, uh, it's uh, launched a rover, uh, about a Jeep-sized uh, rover, one of the largest ever rovers that's going to be landing on the surface of Mars. Um, it's going to be landing there October, August 6th of this year, so pay attention to the news, because when it lands, it's going to be a really, really cool um, landing. And if you haven't watched the video of the um, concept of that uh, landing operation. It's uh, pretty cool and it's on our, um, it's on our websites. So the, a lot, a lot, a lot of media attention to this next program, Commercial Crew. Um, the high level objective of this program is to turn over um, transportation of our crew, that is our astronauts, to and from the International Space Station to the commercial um, industry. So to do that, we've, this program is making investments in um, a number of companies for them to develop their own vehicle and or own rocket to be suitable for human spaceflight. And so um, the fact that this program is housed at Kennedy Space Center was um, very, very welcome uh, news for us, and we're very, very proud that they're um, located uh, here on the uh, East Coast, again, that heartbeat of manned spaceflight. Um, you see a bunch of acronyms, uh, CC Dev 2, that's Commercial Crew Development 2. I, I say it's the phase two of that program that they're undergoing. You see the companies up there. There's some companies with a capsule-like vehicle, um, one company with a wing vehicle, and those are under funded. Uh, you see the word funded up there. That's where NASA um, is providing funding and making investments in those companies to achieve certain milestones in their development phase. And then unfunded, um, we're working with several companies where we're not providing any government funding, but we're providing technical expertise for those companies so we can um, move forward the, the uh, human spaceflight and turn it over to the uh, commercial industry. 
Next program is this ground systems and development um, program. And as John mentioned, there's an awful lot going on at the Kennedy Space Center. It's, it's not represented in smoke and fire as in the launch of a space shuttle, but there's a lot going on on the surface behind the scenes to, to get ready for our next generation of both our government vehicle that we're developing, the SLS or Space Launch System, and the capsule, the uh, multi-purpose crew vehicle, MPCV or Orion, as you may hear it, um, to prepare all the ground systems um, for processing that government vehicle, but also to pre uh, prepare the uh, launch site for processing um, and or launching um, commercial vehicles as well. As well. So the top uh, right up there, that's uh, pad B, 39 um, B. You can see, um, if you recall from the pads of the past, um, this Launch Complex 39A over here on the right, you can see all the surface structure above ground, all that's been wiped away. What you don't see is the stuff up underground. So all the old um, infrastructure, the copper wire has been um, dug up and replaced by fiber optics, again, to modernize our infrastructure in preparation for our next um, vehicle. So a lot of work going on our, uh, uh, in the VAB, the Vertical Assembly Building. We're turning that into a multi-use facility again. Um, we're relocating uh, platforms and revitalizing the platforms um, for di access for different vehicles in there. And we hope not to just have the government SLS vehicle, but also um, commercial vehicles utilize that uh, capability. So I mentioned the word partnership before, and I'm going to emphasize it a little bit more now. Back in 2008, we realized with the retirement or the pending retirement of the space shuttle, we were going to have a lot of excess capacity at the space center, both in terms of infrastructure and workforce. So we set up this uh, front door, this office, so that external people could easily, or more easily, um, get a hold of the resources that they might need to utilize at the Kennedy Space Center, but also for this front office to take a look into. Um, I use this term very loosely, market that excess capability so that we could have um, entice uh, and enable commercial um, space to come to um, our space center. We also located our master planning function within this group, and this master planning looks out 20, 50 years in terms of um, not just the real property and the personal property and the use of the land, but what is the way that we want to um, posture our infrastructure, both the horizontal infrastructure, the power, the water, how do we want to um, engage those utilities 50 years from now. And so um, this group has been very, very effective. I will tell you they have probably worked more than um, 70, 90 uh, agreements, everything from a small company wanting to utilize a lab, all the way to turning over um, OPF3, or Orbital Processing Facility um, number three. Um, we did a partnership with Space Florida um, and uh, Boeing Corporation to process their CTS-100 capsule. So that was a, a huge milestone, recognizing again that previously every bit of that infrastructure, every bit of those facilities were funded um, solely by government funding. Um, and, and typically a, a single program, and we're trying to transition and transform the center into a multi-user, um, diverse uh, customer base there. Um, Budget-wise, um, you, you see up there the President's budget for um, 13, 17.7 billion um, is uh, several million less than what we um, asked for. However, in, in terms of the fiscal environment that we're in as a, a country, um, we feel we we, we feel we did pretty good, and going forward, we think we can um, we can do the job. At Kennedy, we actually um, had an increase, primarily due to the uh, budget that was placed with our commercial crew and making investments with our commercial providers. So we're um, working very hard and hope that uh, that budget uh, uh, um, comes to fruition as we go forward in the next year. So John asked us to talk about what do we consider the biggest uh, threats and opportunities to this future. And I think um, you're probably going to hear a common theme uh, amongst all of us up here, and that is the um, consistency of a, a, a funding profile that allows us to actually execute a plan that we, um, that we can carry out to the end. Um, as, we've, as, as people have looked back over the years, um, there's been 
the path has been littered with unfinished programs and initiatives. And so the, the biggest threat that we have to keeping on the path of our objective of a multi-user um, spaceport is a, a continuous funding profile. Um, the other thing I would say is, if you think about it, we as a government are an excellent uh, service uh, consumer. We buy, we buy lots of services from um, companies. We're allowed to set our requirements. We're allowed to set our agenda. And then we have those um, providers, uh, we pay those providers to do that. Our roles are a little bit reversed now. We are, in fact, um, more service uh, providers. We want the commercial companies and other um, entities to come and utilize our facilities and our infrastructure. And our procedures and our processes, um, from government regulations to internal um, procedures, are not set up to be the most efficient. And so we're working very, very hard at the center to transform from an excellent uh, service uh, consumer to an excellent uh, service provider. Uh, our goals, um, you can see, uh, as you can suspect, uh, the three programs that we have hosted at the Kennedy Space Center, we are here to make them successful. So that's our uh, uh, number one priority. And then again, to turn our spaceport into a uh, multi-user um, spaceport. If you look uh, out uh, 25 and 50 years, our goals, I think our administrator um, said it best up there. Our destinations for humans beyond Earth remain ambitious. They include the moon, asteroids, and Mars. And the debate is not if we will explore, but how we'll do it. And so in general terms, I think that's what our um, long-term 50-year goal is going to be. And with that, uh, I thank you very much. Mike and Janet for including Space Florida as a partner. Can you hear me? This this should work. Thank you. Uh, and I didn't do that, so I'm thrilled. Uh, I probably have one of the more interesting jobs, not only in the state but I think in the country, and that uh, I get to work with absolutely cool people who have uh, accomplished so much in both the National Civil Space Program, uh, but also in our, or in our military, in our National Security Space Program, and that has been a lot of Florida's heritage. Uh, and I can tell you that we are also working with a lot of the new companies. The, the neat thing about this, uh, and I can tell you from first-hand experience of looking at what they're doing and what we're doing, that there is a real bright future uh, for Florida in its aerospace and space industry. And I know many of you probably saw the 60 Minutes presentation that was held a week ago in which they highlighted uh, the shuttle retirement, but they focused on a picture of this area that was almost post-Apollo. Uh, and I considered that, that they got it all wrong. It was the wrong message and they certainly didn't pick up on what I consider the promise to be. Uh, in many respects, shuttle was a part of the picture but its, its completion of its uh, flight program represented a new beginning for all of us. Um, and I think that uh, uh, 60 Minutes may have just been looking through the wrong lens, and perhaps it was a microscope. I will tell you that on the day that NASA flew the last shuttle flight, there were some six other launch vehicles on pads at the Cape. That is hardly the end of a space program and that's the reason I refer to it as a new beginning. I'm going to try to take the Florida lens and then look at the national <coughs> program. And today, Florida's aerospace industry is pretty robust. It's about 4,000 companies, uh, about 75,000 people employed in the state as primary aerospace workers. And it contributes some $9 billion to the state's economy with a total economic impact around $18 billion. There is a secondary related uh, sub-tier and uh, supply chain 
uh, workforce that is equal to that. So it is a significant contributor to our collective economic well-being. And I can tell you that many, many, from that base of employees, we've been able to attract a lot of new companies to this area in recent months, and I have a few of their logos up on the screen. They're coming here because they see that this is a, a friendly and business environment with low regulatory regime. Uh, there's a robust uh, and plentiful skilled workforce. It's a low tax environment, a decent place uh, to work and to live. And they see that as businesses, they can thrive here, especially as aerospace businesses. But the industry itself is an industry in transition. And we're a long way from the 1.3 million workers that we had uh, in the US in 1989. And today that workforce is about half that size. Now many of those losses are, represent productivity gains in how we do things. It's also uh, the fact that the aerospace and space industry are horizontal industries. So they contain a little bit of electronics, a little bit of IT, a little bit of uh, new materials, manufacturing, and I can go on. And we don't always count the growth in those industries as aerospace, but they are more and more integrated with what's going on. What has happened to the industry, though, is that today other nations have discovered space as a catalyst for economic growth. And they all want to participate in it. So there is a lot of global competitiveness as well as some leveling of the technology for space uh, operations. There is a worldwide tightening of federal budgets, and as a result, we're going to see fewer and fewer new program starts and a lot more international collaboration and partnership among countries and certainly among the, with the national government and states and our universities and industry. There has been an industry consolidation among the primes that affects us, but we also, that opens up holes for new sub-tier growth, and we need to target our economic development efforts to attract a lot of those small and mid-tier companies. What we are seeing that opens up new opportunity and new promise is that space is becoming increasingly integrated with other platforms, whether they be aviation, unmanned aerial vehicles, our automobiles, things that are underwater, and even our cell phones. And I'll come back to that point because as we open up the architectures for all of these things, we open up lots of opportunity for new companies to spawn new applications and new technologies to develop. So what is the program today, and John asked us to address that, I see it as diverse. It's becoming more diverse. It will no longer be the province of a large federal agency or national government in general, whether we're talking about the civil program or the national security program, but it will become increasingly more international and increasingly more commercial. In fact, it was commercial companies that figured out how to use one of the attributes of space first, and that's the high upness of it. And so commercial satellites today are a big contributor to every nation's economic well-being. And that's only beginning. Secondly, I think you'll see that it will be more spread among a number of civil agencies, more commercial. You'll see a lot of interplay where even DOD and our national security agencies are sharing assets with commercial satellites and with uh, civil agencies to accomplish their mission. And I think this kind of partnership and sharing across agencies and with uh, commercial companies will stand to open things up and will serve our national well-being. We completed the useful life of the shuttle, maybe not completely, but certainly its last scheduled flight, completed the assembly of the International Space Station. So our space program today will now engage in a focus on what we need to do for exploration and what we need to do for exploitation of the things that we have. And at least for this decade, space exploitation is going to uh, evolve around the International Space Station. And we see the focus of that exploitation being on trying to return benefits from what we might be able to do in that 
platform that's in space in low Earth orbit that will benefit mankind. NASA will use it to develop some of the technologies for long-range exploration, and many, many commercial companies will be using it to see what they can do to advance their knowledge of products, new pharmaceuticals, new chemicals, oil and mineral exploration, and a whole lot of other applications that benefit mankind. There is a focus on small satellites today, and I have a, a model of one here. This is actually a frame for a small satellite. And these things can do some pretty powerful things. They include thrusters, a comm package. They include uh, sensors on board. They can fly in formation. They can be assembled in groups of four or 16. Uh, there are all kinds of things that you can do with them. And there are a whole host of new research and other applications that will evolve as a result of our use of those and we're positioning Florida to play in that marketplace. And I don't need to tell you that as NASA does hard things, and as the DOD and our National Space Program has done hard things, they've advanced technologies in a whole lot of other areas. So we're seeing today space and aerospace technologies applied to clean and alternative energy, new materials, advances in agriculture, and that is what I mean by diversification and an introduction of diversity into today's space program. I'll come back to this use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles because I want to make a point later in the presentation. So what are the threats to America's leadership? And when John asked that question, he was referring to US leadership in space. And I suggest that the biggest single contributor is what I call the lack of ability in Washington to do adequate or to have adequate strategic vision, and then to in make investments on a long-range basis. Our political system is geared to a very short political cycle. Our planning is, is not sufficiently long-range, and we have an inability to invest on a consistent basis with some long-range strategic framework in mind, and that will hurt US space leadership more than any other single factor that I can, I can mention. In my view, that contributes to what we have referred to in the past as a lack of clear space program goals. If you have a clear goal and you're driving all your investments and your technology development toward it, NASA has already shown that they can achieve great things. We did that going to the moon and we've done it in building the space station, which is mankind's single greatest engineering achievement to date. But the program funding for that was scattered and was inconsistent. And there was a variation in political support and commitment and that dragged it out. And that will happen with any goal that we set if we don't think long range and then focus our investments for it. So con continuous political commitment is necessary. And then finally, I think that as a nation, we don't channel sufficient resources into technology advancements that fit with those long-range goals and also develop the human capital that goes along with that. The first area that gets cut when NASA gets squeezed for budget, Congress cuts the technology development line item. I also want you to know I was a consultant for many years, so it's easy to be a critic. Uh, how do we overcome these threats? I think it begins with education. And notice I put education of the taxpayer first, because if we educate the taxpayer about the meaningfulness of the investments that we make in space and space technology, and our space program, and our desire to be leaders in space, our representatives will follow. They work for us, and they shouldn't be dictating how things are done if it's inconsistent with our views. There needs to be clearly an emphasis on broader cooperation and partnerships. And that's internationally, of course, but states play a key role today, as budgets are tight, in partnering with federal government to implement national space policy. And that's becoming more and more evident. And industry and universities have to be a partner in how we advance technologies. More technologies get developed and advanced in industry than they ever have at the national government level. Uh, diversification I've already talked about, but what I mean by that is the introduction, introduction of a whole raft of new space players. Because as you open up space, the same thing that happened with this cell phone 
when the uh, software developers made the architecture open and thousands of new companies got into the business of developing applications for it will happen when we get more and more people involved in doing things in space. And that will in turn, and we can use the space station as a platform for doing that, uh, advancing new technologies and spawning lots of new companies and applications. So what's the future? I think this is a picture of the skies over Florida in the future. You're going to see a whole host of new kinds of vehicles flying. Horizontal spacecraft taking off from Kennedy and from other spaceports that we plan to develop, to develop in Florida. Florida will be a multi-spaceport state. We'll see next generation spacecraft that are already being built here by Lockheed Martin with its Orion and hopefully as the commercial crew program advances by Boeing with its CST-100. We're going to see the International Space Station as a platform and Florida as the ground node for that. And we'll see new kinds of launch vehicles and large hybrid air vehicles. And that's a Grumman vehicle that I expect to see flying over the skies of Florida soon. Florida's working hard, Space Florida's working hard, and as a, as a state we're working hard to diversify the kinds of activity, launch activity, that uh, has taken place at the Cape, which has historically been large heavy rockets. We're looking to open up the small end of the rocket business so that we can in fact see a lot more fire and smoke, as Janet referred to. Uh, so we're developing Launch Complex 46 and 36. We'll be flying Athenas and, and Minotaurs. Uh, we've already uh, arranged a deal with Maston to fly a, a vertical vehicle. It takes off vertically and lands vertically. And we expect uh, to see some very interesting th things coming out of that. But more importantly, commercialization of a lot of the other assets that we have like the shuttle landing facility and opening that up. In the future, I can see the key developing a component of it that is a commercial spaceport operated by perhaps a state or federal spaceport authority, and I can see NASA and DOD and others being users of that capability. I've already mentioned ISS utilization. I'll simply call attention to the fact that Florida bid on and won the role of an organization called CASIS, which is the manager of the portion of the International Space Station that is a national lab. And what that really means is that CASIS is charged with developing a new market for space station composed of industry users, commercial pharmaceutical companies, oil industry, big, big bio-life sciences companies, materials companies, like Dow Chemical, 3M, Corning Glass, and others. And they're looking to take advantage of some attribute of space, whether it's the zero gravity or the high vacuum or the high radiation environment, and to conduct research that advances product or advances their product development schedules. And as I mentioned, bringing benefits back to the people on Earth. Florida is the ground node for use of the International Space Station. And I'm gonna close with a picture of what I also expect to see over the skies of Florida. We're focusing on the development of an industry built around unmanned aerial vehicles because many of these vehicles are space enabled. There is more and more of an integration of space with aviation, with these unmanned aerial vehicles, and with vehicles on the ground and undersea. And what's happening with all of them is that they'll be developing new applications in Agriculture, if you think about it, these are platforms that you put sensors on board and a comm package and they move around. That's no different than a satellite. It's no different than an aircraft. Uh, it's no different than your automobile. And I think if we think about all of the applications that could be possible as we take this kind of compute capability and embed it in all of those moving vehicles, we should be able to know where we're going, have it talk to us, we're driving down the road in cars that are only two years away that will tell us what route we're on. And by the way, it checked our Outlook schedule and we're 30 minutes behind for our one o'clock appointment. We suggest you take this route. And by the way, if you take that route, you should be five minutes ahead. And we know you like uh, caramel lattes and 
and Starbucks will know that you're driving that route, so it's going to push a discount coupon to you. And those kinds of services are all value-added information services that are possible when we make this the network. If I want to talk to Mike, I'm going to have to go through Janet's phone because that'll be part of the network, no longer those cell towers that are out there. So we're moving into a high era of integration that is largely enabled by space assets. And I suggest that that's a very, very bright and promising future for all of us. So with that, uh, I'm going to close and hopefully we'll have questions, uh, opportunity for questions later. But it is uh, fun to think about all the promise that we have and Florida is well positioned to capitalize on a lot of that. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Carol and John, for hosting this. And my good friends, Janet and Frank, for being on the panel. See, two things happen when you're the last presenter. One is you get to see the other presentations first, and I can decide whether to agree or disagree with them. And the other thing is you know how you're doing on time. And um, so we're doing okay on time, but we really, truly want to save, save some time for your questions. So I'm going to go through my presentation rather quickly. Um, so be thinking about questions, and, and, uh, and we'll entertain them at the end. This is what I'd like to talk to you about. Um, I'll give you a little background on the United Launch Alliance, our near-term projects and, and programs, and then get into the threats and opportunities. Before I get into the presentation, I want to give you my, my punchline first. And it's this. If we don't have a change in, in direction from Washington, D.C., we will be launching American, rock, American astronauts on American rockets from the Space Coast again in five years. That's a fact. It is headed that way, and assuming we get funding to support that, it is going to happen again. We, we, uh, everyone in this room hates the, ideas of being, hates the idea of being reliant on the Russians for crew transport to the space station. Uh, we all just... Well, we hate it. And, and so we're working very, very hard on, on getting that access to, to the space station on our rockets again. And you'll see here shortly how we're going to do that. United Launch Alliance, very quickly, is a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Uh, we have the Delta and Atlas uh, lines of rockets. We've seen them launch off the Space Coast for many years and out west, of course. Uh, it represents nearly a century of, of experience in the launch business. Um, over uh, 1,300 launches between those two product lines. And our EELV uh, rockets that Janet talked about in the, in the uh, launch services program, they're flight proven, qualified, very, very reliable. And you'll see a slide here shortly that talks to that reliability. And also, it's going to be a good deal for the country. We're, we have consolidated our industrial base. We're building all the rockets in one plant up in northern Alabama. And also, we're, provo we're providing a, a bulk buy opportunity to the Department of Defense that will reduce the cost of, for those missions. Well, let's see. Here we go. This is what I like to call our, our family portrait. Since United Launch Alliance was formed six years ago, we've had 59 missions, 100% success rate. I would challenge anybody in the world to, to meet that success rate. We have 11 launches uh, this year. We've completed two already, one off the East Coast, one off the West. We have a rocket out on pad uh, 41 right now going through a fueling test. That guy will launch May the 5th or 3rd if SpaceX uh, cooperates with us. We also have a, a Delta rocket on pad 37 that will launch in June. So 100% success rate, and you'll see why that's important later. Um, we're heavily involved in the commercial crew pro program. Of course, that's the uh, cargo and, and human capability to the space station, and that allows NASA to focus on the high-risk, high-reward R&D. The Commercial Crew Development Program, as Janet said, started in 2008. We've been a partner in one form or another since then. CCDEV-1 um, started in 2008. Uh, one of the things we need to do to our rocket, uh, principally the Atlas V, is to develop an emergency detection system. And that's a fault detection system of the rocket systems itself. And be able to send an abort signal to the abort uh, uh, capability on the spacecraft. We haven't had that, that need before with, with uh, payloads on top of the rocket. But with men on top of the rocket, we need to abort like the old uh, Mercury and Apollo had that capability. 
And so we're developing that emergency detection system. It's about at the 60, 70 percent design stage now. We have a prototype uh, that's it's in a test cell right now. And that will go on the Atlas V rocket. CCDEV2, uh, we're supporting the funded, pro, uh, funded partners. And the partners are Sierra Nevada, which is this vehicle. It's the wing vehicle that Frank talked about, the mini shuttle, as it were. Blue Origin has a biconical shape. It's not shown on this slide. And Boeing has the, uh, the CST vehicle. Uh, there's an unfunded par portion of the Space Act agreement that we're, that we're uh, involved in. We're putting up all of our own money, United Launch Alliance money, to continue on with this program. And CCI CAP is a commercial crew integrated capability. That's the current NASA solicitation on the street that we're partners on uh, with all three of those companies. And that... Uh, that portion of the commercial crew development is looking at combining the spacecraft, the launch vehicle, the ground systems, and mission control into one integrated proposal back to NASA. Here are four companies could propose just on the spacecraft, or just on the vehicle, or just on the launch vehicle. This time, the CCI cap, integrated uh, capability, is marrying all the, all the portions of a, of, a, of a flight that you can think of. The spacecraft, the launch vehicle, ground, and, and mission control. Atlas V will be the launch vehicle for the commercial crew program. Uh, it's been chosen by, by those three companies. The other entrant into the commercial crew uh, in, uh, arena, of course, is SpaceX. You've heard a lot about them. They have their own vehicle and own, and own uh, spacecraft. But the other three um, companies will all fly on the Atlas V off of Complex 41 at the, at the Cape. Uh, it's only, NASA's only Category 3 vehicle, which means it's the most highly reliable, and uh, it, it's launched all the, the really expensive interplanetary missions. Um, it's done a lot of the, the National Reconnaissance Office missions, and so it, it's, it's trusted by, by the nation to launch very, very critical payloads, and will be trusted to launch humans as well. But see, we're making good progress in our portion of the CCDEV um, uh, system. We've completed a tailored systems requirement review. We've done a safety analysis. And this summer, we'll complete our, our, uh, our systems readiness review, which is essentially a compilation of all requirements for the vehicle, and then how we're going to satisfy working off those requirements. Uh, space launch uh, system, should it be system up there on services? Um, we're going to be the, the launch vehicle for the Exploration Flight Test 1. You see it here. It'll launch. Oops. It'll launch on a, uh, on a Delta IV heavy vehicle. There's one of those on pad 37 right now going through preparations for a June launch. Test objectives, demonstrate the ability to integrate the spacecraft, launch vehicle, ground and mission control, test and checkout, of course, and then, control, and, and then a control, very high speed reentry, mimicking a, a mission back from the, from the moon or Mars. Uh, present focus is, is, of course, unmanned configuration. It'll be the Orion uh, vehicle and we'll have a launch abort system jettison motors. We'll be doing all the mission integration, and the estimated launch date is 2014. I'll tell you, we, we now have a, an internal planning date, um, so I don't want to read this in the paper, but it, it's going to be uh, John. <laughs> it's on the order of September 2014, so that, that'll, be, that'll be our planning date for that mission. Very, very exciting mission. Here's the configuration of the vehicle. Again, the Delta IV Heavy, which has three liquid boosters, a core stage and two strap-on liquid boosters. All the interface, have a, we have a Delta upper stage, a cryo upper stage, and then the spacecraft and the abort system on top. It has Russian-made engines. You may hear a lot about um, why we're we using Russian engines. They're very, very reliable, and they, and they have a good cost. Um, I wish uh, the United States could produce another uh, liquid-fueled engine, um, and, and hopefully we'll be doing that one day. But right now we're relying on the Russians for those engines. It has a thing called staggered start. Um, we're going to start the engines in a sequence rather than all three at once. It will demonstrate also the GPS metric tracking, global positioning system metric tracking. That's a range safety upgrade. In fact, we flew that, uh, that upgrade on the, on the first launch off the Cape this year on the Atlas rocket. And if that does prove out to be a successful system that will eliminate several of the, uh, of the ground tracking uh, stations for range safety. 
the vehicle. We already talked a little bit about the vehicle, so we'll move on. Here's the mission profile. Launch out of the Cape. Uh, do a couple of burns. Do almost two orbits. Get to a, a very high inclination uh, attitude, and then perform the entry and splash down in the, in the ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, at a very high rate of speed. Again, to demonstrate uh, the capability for entry from, from the moon or Mars. Threats and opportunities. Um, I mentioned I was able to listen to Janet and Frank first, and, and we did not share slides before this presentation. So the fact that you're going to hear a common theme is, is, is because we all believe it. The most significant threat, in my mind, to the U.S. space program is lack of an enduring national space policy. Um, every time we get a change of administration, we get a new space policy. We lost uh, Columbia in 2003, and President Bush in 2004 announced his vision for space exploration, the Constellation Program. We were well on the way to, to bring that program to fruition. We had a test flight of the, of the Ares-1 rocket, and that went very, very well. Um, change of administration, canceled Constellation, and it took a full year for the new administration even to announce what they wanted to do. And so my biggest threat, the way I see the biggest threat, is that lack of enduring national space policy. Human space systems, uh, long-term development, just by their very nature, it takes six to eight years to develop and get them flying. The secondary threat, of course, is the, is the funding that, that both Frank and Janet talked about. The opportunity, of course, is, is just to deal with that threat. It's to, it's to establish an, an enduring national space policy, one that's decade long, generational, perhaps, and international. The way, the way the space program is going now, if you look at the International Space Station, it is truly an international space station. And, and not only is that important from a political perspective, it's important from a, from a funding perspective. These big programs that we're about to, to take on, when we do end up going back to the moon and on to Mars, one nation won't do that. It will be an international cooperation. There's no doubt about that. But in order to do that, we have to co continue to cooperate, and the International Space Station is, is an outstanding example of how cooperation can occur. Tremendous partners. Now, what does it take to get to a, an enduring space policy? Well, in my mind, you have to have a valid reason for doing it. It's got to capture the public support, long-term development, long-term funding, and international involvement and support, of course. What is it? What is, what is the long-term policy, the program, that we should have? Mike Leinbach believes it's colonization of another body. I think that will capture support. It's a truly, obviously, a long-term project. It should go back, we should go back to the moon first, then to Mars. I don't believe going to an asteroid is, is right now worth it, frankly. I think we ought to start down the path of colonization. Now, I don't believe in warp drive, um, and I'm an engineer, so you know it's going to take a long, long time to do all this. But if we don't start now, we may never start. So I think we as a, as a, as a body, as a, as, a, as a people across the world can decide to do something like this. We ought to have an international collection of, the, of the, all the space agencies and the brightest people and, and commit to doing this and, and have it in law so that the next administration can't change it. And that's easy to say, very hard to do, right? But the biggest threat is we keep changing direction every four years. We're at the will of the president. We're at the will of Congress. Um, every new president wants to put his, his or her fingerprints onto the policy, onto NASA. NASA's Worked for NASA for 27 years, so I can say NASA is a, is a, is a pawn of a political process. And I, and I don't like it, but it, that's the way it is. And so we have an opportunity to change that, to put in place an enduring national space policy. And it ought to be based on a long term goal. In my mind, that's colonization. And just decide to do that now and start with those tiny, tiny baby steps of doing that long term, many, many generations. <coughs> In summary, the um, United Launch Alliance, we support all of Congress's efforts. Uh, we're well positioned to be the launch vehicle for three of the four providers for crew access. As I open my comments, we, this will happen. We will be launching Americans on American rockets off the space coast again. 
our rockets will be ready for this in about three years. The long poles for, for ULA is the final development of the emergency detection system, and then also the, the construction of crew access out of Complex 41. Complex 41, of course, has launched uh, dozens of payload, <coughs> payloads on, on our expendable rockets, but never, never manned, so therefore we never had the need to get to the top of the rocket to load the crew. So there is no crew access at Complex 41. We're in the process of designing that right now. We'll have an emergency egress system similar to the Space Shuttle Program's emergency egress system. And so for two long poles for ULA are, is the final development of the detection system on board the rocket <coughs> and construction of the access out of the pad. Those two things would take us about three years to complete. The, the uh, spacecraft providers, the Boeing, Sierra Nevada, Blue Origin, they're on a path with, with continued funding to be ready in about five years. So if you read in the paper that we might be able to launch humans sooner than five years, I'm one that would love to do that. If we had more money, we could, because we could speed up both our contribution to it, our portion of it, as well as the spacecraft's portion of it. But the reality of it is, folks, it's going to be five years until we see Americans on top of American rockets again. And with that, I thank you for your time. I really appreciate uh, the, the presentations here, and, and we wanted to leave time for questions, and we and we have some time for that. Um, and basically, uh, what I would ask you guys to do, I think we have a microphone moving around. Is that right? So, if you have a question uh, for somebody on the panel, uh, if you'd raise your hand, and and we'll take as many as we can. And uh, just if you if you want to direct it to a certain person, please please do so. And and if it's just generally to the panel. Uh, We'll address that. I am uh, Angel Fish. I'm Angel Fish, and my question to anyone on the panel is, you know, I think you, uh, I don't see no mention of uh, the Air Force. How are you going to improve the range? That is a big loss that hasn't been improved in the last 25 years. I think Angel's question was that he, uh, he heard a lot of uh, discussion of other things, but did not hear anyone address the Air Force and the range and uh, improvements that may or may not be needed there in order to advance forward. Well, so I'll take a, I'll take a uh, first shot at it. Uh, the Air Force is going through an upgrade project for the range right now. Uh, I mentioned the, the global positioning system, that tracking, <coughs> that's part of it. What they want to go to is a space-based range where, where um, destruct signals can be sent to the rockets uh, through a satellite system to the, to the ascending rocket as opposed from ground stations, opposed from the ground station out here. Um, so they are going through a major upgrade uh, of all range systems, of computers, etc. Um, it always becomes an issue of, of time on the range, getting a slot on the range. And part of that has been the turnaround of the range from one vehicle to another. It used to take, you know, two days if, uh, if an Atlas were launching and then the shuttle wanted to launch or land, it, it was a necessity to wait two days for them to reconfigure their systems. They're getting to a position of if all these upgrades come to pass, that they can do that within one shift. And so um, that'll help. That'll help from a user, from a user standpoint. <clears throat> anyway. I'd just like to add a comment to that. Space Florida works with uh, the Air Force regularly in support of commercial customers. And I can tell you that in the last several range commanders that have been there, uh, and the commanders of the 45th Space Wing. There have been some incredible, uh, there's been some incredible progress that's been made in streamlining procedures and making it easier to get range clearances and working the companies through the gates so that they can fly and meet all of the, the uh, standards and requirements that they have to. Uh, I think we are, we are going to be in a stage where we are very, very competitive with any other range and spaceport uh, anywhere in the world for that matter. I just wanted to add also from a NASA perspective, you may recall um, the 21st century, there was some funding um, given to improve and modernize the range. And our ground um, services uh, development uh, program is working very close with the 45th Space Wing and making several investments on their side to improve the capability at the range and improve some of their systems and their infrastructure up there to modernize it and whatever the bottlenecks are to help uh, go through that. So we are participating. But I, 
also wanted to echo what Frank said in talking with um, a number of the commercial providers, SpaceX, uh, et cetera, they're very, um, they would give you a very different picture today versus years ago as far as range operations and what the um, range is able to do. So it is getting better. We've talked a lot about the range, and I was just wondering if we're ever going to get to the point where the range can simultaneously handle more than one vehicle at a time. And then in watching your presentations tonight, I've seen a lot of emphasis about flying from the Cape side. And I know that the master planners at KSC are working very hard to be able to be flexible enough to fly vehicles from 39A and B. And the only thing I see on the horizon for either one of those paths apparently is the SLS. Are there any other vehicles that we would be bringing to KSC? Yes, I, I can address the second part of that question uh, quite uh, quite readily. Yes, the only definitive vehicle um, that we can say is uh, for sure launching off of Launch Complex 39 is the SLS, as you indicate. But that uh, partnership office that I was talking um, with you about is currently working agreements with a number of providers. Um, they have requested us directly to um, provide them some information and some data and some um, commitments as to uh, to allow us to uh, launch their vehicle off those um, launch complexes. So we have very, very active um, agreements uh, being, uh, being worked to that end. So I, I can't really give their names. There's a lot of proprietary um, information there, but all the, all the usual suspects, as you might uh, imagine, have requested uh, to launch off that uh, launch complex. Um, and by the way, we work very closely in partnership with Space Florida because as they, you know, they mentioned they're enabling um, commercial to come on the Air Force side. We're working with them to take advantage and to um, entice the uh, commercial providers to, to come to the Space Coast also. So I'll take a, a cut at your first question about launching two on the same day or simultaneously. There's a little launch track. I, this may sound a little glib, but I wouldn't want two going at the same time. Um, there's a lot to do to prepare, to prepare and launch a vehicle, both uh, the vehicle itself and from the range perspective. Uh, there isn't that amount of, of need right now, frankly, to have multiple vehicles at the same time. Uh, it can get bottleneck, yes, but uh, you know we've been able to work that out. I, I, we're a long way away from needing to launch two on the same day. I'll just put it that way. Um, are there currently any solid, actual, like, timeline-based programs to return us to the moon or some other planetary body that have actually started to be funded and worked on as of right now? I was going to say, there, there is a private venture that's looking at doing that, and there are uh, some com competitions out there to do that. But I'll make the comment that I agree with Mike completely, that before long, I think you will see a commitment to the return to the moon with exactly the kind of solid schedule that you've asked for. Just because we've gone there before doesn't mean that it's trivial to go back. And when we were there, we had great difficulty keeping our astronauts from cooking, opening uh, the spacecraft, lost oxygen. There were other factors associated with our ability to be outside the spacecraft for very, very long. We need to develop the technologies for closed loop environmental support systems and habitats and rovers so that we can exploit not only the surface of the moon, but develop the technologies for doing that long range space flight that we all want. So I think you will see it soon. Right here. Hi, my question specifically is for Frank. You mentioned that Florida is going to be a multi spaceport state. And in the interest of taxpayer education, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about what those are, um, what they'd be doing, and why, given some of the stuff that Janet said, we would be going that direction if it doesn't appear that we're fully utilizing all of the facility and human capabilities at the spaceport that we currently have here. Well, I think we have to stop thinking of spaceports as simply a place where you launch a large civil or military program from. In fact, there are different spaceports for different needs. We already have two uh, spaceport locations, one clearly at the Cape, which is a combination of, of NASA, the Air Force, and some commercial activity. Uh, Jacksonville has also been designated a commercial spaceport that can handle horizontal spacecraft taking off 
and conducting a variety of missions, eventually um, space adventure tourism, as well as <coughs> using uh, these spacecraft that take off horizontally for research purposes. I expect to develop some launch complexes in other parts of the state to give future operators flexibility, because when you take off horizontally and you go up to the edge of space and you come down, most of them right now are configured to come down unpowered. And you want to give them flexibility for operations so that they can land in different sites. Secondly, you'd like to be able to fly smaller rockets for educational purposes and to truly make Florida's educational system one that's geared to producing the kinds of space systems engineers that we want. We think that we need to start flying uh, from locations with uh, satellites that are the size of that little cube there and, and uh, doing a whole lot of other research that is university and industry based. I hope that answers your question. Do we have any other questions? Anyone? You can raise your hand, Fiorella can find you there in the crowd. Raise them up high. I think we have one back here. Good evening. This isn't really a question. It is a comment. I do appreciate all of you being here and spending the time to explain all this to us. But I take issue with Mike saying that the administration in now is the one who is getting rid of the funding. No, he had a panel tell him what they felt with the limited money that Congress, it is Congress, and President Bush did say he wanted this constellation. He could have said he wanted anything, but without the funding we don't get what our president wants, either one. And I just don't think it's fair to blame one president against another that, oh, well, this last president said, let's have this constellation program, and yet we can't have it because we didn't have the funding. It was proven. All I'm saying is you need to tell people if you want this type of program, you've got to write your representatives because they're the ones that control the purse strings. The president, it doesn't matter which president and what which president wants, you've got to get the funding and your representative has to know you want the space program so you've got to get the funding. Well, I appreciate the comment and, and um, you're exactly right about the funding and where the funding comes from, no question about that. Um, you know, I was recounting history. President Bush set us on one path and we were well on the way to bringing consolation program uh, to fruition. Were we behind schedule, behind budget a little bit? It, it's yes, but we had a test flight under our belt and we were going well and bless their hearts, the people in the consolation program were doing tremendous things with the money they had. And so the administration changes and, and in part due to the funding issue, then that, that program was canceled. It, it took a year to announce something else. And so it, it, just, it just seems to me that we need to set a long-term policy and stick to it. It, it. it just changes too often. This one. Hi, my name is Renee. I'm from Florida Tech and the International Space University. Um, thanks for that presentation of the three aspects of the space program. My question is about the future of scientific research opportunities at KSC, <coughs> including the Space Life Science Laboratory, the future of that, and the upcoming, I guess it's called Exploration Park, the one that's being constructed on the property. What's the status of that? They're coming along. I think everyone knows that we had a, a, a pipe leak at the Space Lab Sciences Lab and uh, we had to vacate the building, which we have now remedied and we're bringing everyone back into it. We're repurposing a lot of the laboratory space to enhance it so that it will support a lot of the research that we expect to be conducted on the International Space Station. And we're actually building a separate live animal care facility to support a lot of the needs of the bio life sciences and the pharmaceutical industry. Much of that research is university affiliated. Uh, and we hope uh, to really get all of Florida's universities active and involved 
in not just the research on the station, but in developing a lot of the technologies that we will need for long-range space exploration, partnering with NASA, partnering with commercial companies to do that. So uh, I think Florida's presence in research will grow over the next decade. Right now, and I don't know the number, Janet, but I suspect that it's close to a million dollars a year of actual research money that we get. Yeah, that's about right. And that's, that's a tragedy, but then again, the mission of the Kennedy Space Center has not been as a research center, so that has to be understood in that context. We can and should aggressively go after more research for Florida's industry and universities. And just before you leave, I want to put a plug in. You said you were from um, Florida Tech. Um, for those of you who don't know, this summer, um, Ke uh, Kennedy Space Center is co-hosting with uh, Florida Tech, um, the International Space University's um, flagship program, the Space Studies Program. And it's a nine-week uh, program. And, and why I mention it here is there's international. So there's about 140 students and young professionals from over 30 different countries all over the world that are going to be descending on Central Florida for this 10-week um, program and get immersed. And they'll be learning down at Florida Tech, and we'll be hosting them quite frequently up, up at the Kennedy Space Center and um, showing them our capabilities and providing our expertise to them. And it's a really, really great program. You'll probably hear a lot about it uh, in the months coming forward. I just want to plug that a little. Well, I appreciate uh, everyone for coming out. Um, I was I didn't have any more questions for the panel. I was going to ask uh, if they each if any of them had anything they wanted to add after the questions that were asked. Um, but I did want to expound on on Mike's point in answer to one of the questions. Um, one of the problems in terms of it, I think when we talk about administrations and we talk about the political the political aspects of this that we've written about a great deal um, over the years is the short-term nature of the way this, the political system here is structured. So you have a Congress, a House of Representatives that overturns every two years, um, a Senate that's continually changing, and then new presidential administrations. There's only one, um, well, there's two major space programs that survived that over time, and they were the Space Shuttle and the Space Station. And, and they're both truly remarkable, not only for the engineering feat that was involved, but for the fact that they were conceived and designed and then operated over a period of decades in, in that fickle environment. And what we're experiencing now is exactly what was experienced um, between Apollo and shuttle, and between what I would imagine between any next transitions in the, in the space program, which is that when you get into an environment where there isn't a program or a program is going away, that short-term nature of our political system really exacerbates that problem. So, um, in any event, I, I think it's been a bipartisan team effort <laughs> across all three, all, both branches of government. Um, in any event, um, I did want to ask if the pan panelists an opportunity if they had anything to add, and um, does anyone have anything else? I would just mention this coming um, Tuesday, uh, we will see the uh, Shuttle Discovery's final flight um, leaving from the east coast here of Florida. It will be taken off uh, about 7 o'clock in the morning. It's going to fly south along the coast um, to around Patrick Air Force Base, and then it's going to turn, uh, turn around and make a final flyover the, uh, the shuttle launch uh, landing facility and then to its final home in Smithsonian. So if anyone um, uh, once you come see that, go out to the uh, to the beach along the coast, and you'll have a uh, one last flight of uh, discovery aboard the uh, shuttle carrier aircraft. If you don't get out to see that, we will be broadcasting that live online um, throughout the day, and including that part in Washington. So if you do have to go out to the beach and you can get back home, you can watch the end of the arrival um, on our website. I'll just make one comment, uh, uh, and it picks up on a lot of themes, but uh, the, the, the morass that we're in, and I, sh I don't mean to say that it's all that because there are a lot of good things in the nation's space program, whether we're looking at the civil component, the national security component, or what could be a promising commercial component, uh, and that's shared by many administrations. These decisions uh, to retire the shuttle and, and move in this direction were made over multiple administrations, but only the Congress can determine how long we're going to continue to pay the Russians 
to fly astronauts to this to space, and that is up to them. So uh, I think that what's really needed, they work for us, uh, right? Get grassroots support, writing to let them know whether they're local uh, Congress people or or national from some other state. Let them know that this is a national tragedy and they need to respond. Funding commercial crew and commercial cargo uh, developers will, in fact, advance the schedule. I believe that over the long run. And the capabilities are in industry. They're known in industry. It's the same companies that have been flying, of course. Uh, so we can, in fact, uh, solve that problem, and we should. But we need grassroots support to let uh, our representatives know that uh, we're watching. All of our representatives, I mean, we have over maybe one or two congressional districts in this room. There's 433 other congressional districts. I mean, how do we, I mean, how do we go about doing that? I mean, is there any kind of national uh, public relations type campaign that's going to happen? Because we need to fit, we need to convince that congressman in Hawaii and Montana and New Mexico that it's worth the trouble to do all this. I'll come in and I, I invite others too as well. There are a number of, of both grassroots as well as national organizations that try to message the Congress and demonstrate support. But until we get really vocal at the voting booth, I don't think these men and women that represent us are going to really respond to that. They have a whole lot of other issues besides space. And unfortunately, that when you have a, a, a representative form of government, they believe that they're responding to their constituents. So the senators and the congressmen from Utah want the program that is best for Utah. And those that are in California want the program that's best in California. And I could go on. So we often get a, a system that represents the best political constituency compromise that they can get, as opposed to what the agency or the administration in power at the time really want. But I go back to it and I say, if, if NASA proposes a solution to a national goal that's set, <coughs> they should all commit to funding that over the long term. That is the solution, and we really got to address that issue before we find our way out of this. Okay. I, I thank everybody for coming out tonight, and thank Fiorella and the, the staff here at the planetarium for hosting us all, and I know you all want to give them a round of applause. I hope everybody has a good weekend, and thank you for coming. Thank you. And I see you in the fall, John, Janet, Frank, and Mike, on behalf of Brava Community College and the Planetarium staff, we thank you very much for your support, and we look forward to a fruitful future. Thank you, and see you all in the fall.